What's up, guys? We are live here with our macro call. I got Jay Titta and Isaac the Schick Newton in here. I'm just going to come to you, let you know our updated views of the markets. We're going to go through some, I'm sure JT is going to go through some Federal Reserve data. We're going to go through some charts. We're going to look at crypto. We're going to look at equities. And I'm going to talk about this Bitcoin ETF and give you guys a perspective that I know most people, 99% of people, uh, isn't taking it into account. So how you guys doing today, man? Good. Yeah, I'm doing swell. Very nice. Yes, I'm also swollen. Right now, but okay. You're swollen? Are you okay? I mean, Y'all both gave one word answers. I thought I was going to have time to read this text, but he's like, good, swell. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to say good, too. I'm copying his. his <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, so central bank balance sheet, this continues to drop. Nothing new here. This con continues to consolidate. Gold is at an all-time high, resistance level-ish. Here we are at the S&P. The S&P is at an all-time high, which is kind of crazy. But, you know, we've been talking about this for weeks. Same thing with the Dow. It's at an all-time high. And we're on the monthly chart here. So we actually had a close at an all-time high in December. NASDAQ, near all-time high levels. And then we got Apple pretty much at all time high levels. Everything's just at all time high except crypto. You look at Bitcoin and you can see that, okay, so now we're on the weekly. You can see that we have not had a bearish week close yet, but if the market continues like this and we get a weekly close, if we get a close below 40K, man, I think we're probably gonna, like the next major liquidity zone is 35. We, I'm, I'm thinking we'll probably go to 35 uh, or maybe even 30. If we what do you guys think uh, the drop today in crypto? Because Ethereum was down, what, 4%? Uh, Pendle was down like 12%. And so what, what do you guys think is the reason we've just seen this drop? I'm about to go through that right now. And I think it's revolving around the Bitcoin ETF and it's affecting everything. Ethereum has actually been holding quite strong. Let's actually go to the weekly here. Uh, well, not as strong as I thought, God damn it. Ethereum's had two red weeks in a row. And then if you look at the entire crypto market cap, it's kind of been rejecting off of this level. And you know what they say, longer ways to hire the chase. I do still think we're going to come back down to the $1.2 trillion level to retest uh, before we take off and blow through this level. Market likes to move between ceilings and floors. And then we've been seeing the stablecoin market cap start to go up. And when you see that, that means people are selling their cryptos and buying stable coins. So we want to see this go down. Uh, whenever we're in a bull market, we're seeing stable coin liquidity like around these levels, not these levels. Same exact thing with USDC. We're kind of seeing a tick up, but the USDT market cap is much larger. So that's why we're seeing that. And, you know, like JT was saying, if you look at altcoins, we took profits at these levels here for Pendle. Uh, it went up to $2.43. cents. Now it's dropping. Arbitrum is dropping. Look at that. We took profits here. If you guys were watching the channel, you could have made some money. Optimism, we took profits here at this red line. Now it's coming back here within this channel. Uh, Chainlink is still holding strong, strong resistance off this level. But like I said before, longer the base, the higher the chase. I think if it keeps consolidating here, it's going to be like a nasty drop. Probably go back down to 10 bucks. Same thing with Maple. We're going to be making a video on Maple this week. So be on the lookout for that. And then if you look at Solana, it's been dropping pretty precipitously. That's the word we haven't used in a while. So why do what? Why do we think that this is happening? Well, if you think about narratives, let's go back to the Bitcoin chart. I think a big reason why Bitcoin was pumping pretty much since the depths of what 2022 was because people were suspecting an ETF. And while this was one of the most successful ETF launches in history, it still was pretty not as it didn't go how most people thought so you guys follow this account on twitter cc15 capital or capital 15c is the at name i'll give him his credit or her uh it's been releasing all of the data of the bitcoin etf since it's been released so this is the kicker here right so we look at this number uh which is three point something billion dollars in value and we look at that and go oh my god it's that much new money in bitcoin and even if that were the case, that still wouldn't be crazy. But this is not new money. This is 
Bitcoin that people sold, and it's likely people with money in their 401ks or IRAs or Roth, you know, accounts and things like that. People are selling their grayscale Bitcoin trust and they're cycling it into these other ETFs. And the reason why is because their annual fee is much lower. Grayscale charges 1.5% annually when you can get a BlackRock or Fidelity or these other ETFs and you can pay 0.25%. So before the ETF launch, Grayscale had over 620,000 Bitcoin. And now you can see they're at 619. They actually had an outflow of 66,420 Bitcoin. So when you do the math on that, it's actually only an inflow of $1.2 billion in new money, like in new Bitcoin, because people are cycling out of their grayscale ETFs, right? And you can see that they had an outflow of 66,420 Bitcoin, while all these other ETFs had an inflow because they were selling from there. So even if you scratch that, like guys, you can see that they're buying more and more Bitcoin. Like you, you see 2,000, 11,000, 16, 25, and it's all trending upwards, but it's not, the demand isn't enough. We've had days where there was more than a billion dollars in buying volume uh, or in, just inflows, not even volume uh, in Bitcoin or even Ethereum. If this doesn't like start to pick up here the next few weeks, we're already seeing Bitcoin starting to roll over. I definitely think it's just going to confirm more that, you know, I think a correction is going to come. And this is these, these are just what the numbers are saying. What's your guys' thoughts? I heard the other day that ETFs are usually approved around the peak of the hack at our product. And the so if, at our product? Yeah, if that's the case, or commodity, I mean, if that's the case. Price peak? Yes. Or, okay. If, if that's or peak hype, you know what? I'm not sure that's a great question. Uh, but if that's the case, either way, um, we should continue to see softening in Bitcoin, which we kind of expected anyway after the uh, ETF approval. But yeah, that's just an interesting, is what that could be considered a stat, yeah, that I heard the other day. But Isaac, I'll let you take it away there. And that's an interesting, uh, we could fact check that to see if that's accurate. But that, that is an interesting point. I think this is like kind of to be expected. I mean, we kind of like low key called this when we were just looking at the, the bowl that was forming. Yeah. And like that looks like it's prime to drop. I mean, it makes sense that it corrected from all the hype because now like something has been delivered. The price is now corrected back to reality instead of just buying on the hype. I could see it drop a bit from here. I don't want to make any prediction on where I think it's going to drop to, but like the ETF is saying it's going to take time to build up, right? Like the first ETF was approved uh, or the first like couple there is going to be more built on top of this. This is like the ground, the groundwork, right? Like we've just built the foundation of something that is going to now take months and years to build upon and for, and for it to get properly integrated into the financial structure. That's a trickle. That's not like a, like a pop. This, finan this uh, ETF launching was a big pop. Now the bubble's blown. Things are coming back to reality. I don't know where it's going to settle, but we'll then see it trickle up from there as more liquidity is brought in. So I think in the long term, I mean, this is still a very good thing. But markets often overestimate things or overreact to things. I think this was an overreaction to something that's going to take a long time to really build up. You know, and yeah. I, I really like what you said, uh, Vince, as well. Uh, that was interesting. I didn't, I didn't actually know the exact liquidity amounts and where that liquidity was coming from so that was an interesting breakdown yeah just to piggyback off of that like the fact that it's going to take some time and we covered this in another video that we did on the etfs but if you look this is the gold chart and gold's etf got approved november 18 2004 which was my mom's birthday and it kind of it pretty much consolidated at the 447 dollar price range until it broke out in september of 2005 so literally was that 10 months later, it, it took in, until it started to rally. So I'm not going to say that it's going to take Bitcoin around the same time. But like Isaac said, it's the foundation for, you know, people to start pouring liquidity in. How long it's going to take, I'm not sure. But I wouldn't be surprised if things started to, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened a little sooner just because you got the Bitcoin halving coming up. 
But yeah, I'm not expecting this to like start taking off. Like, and you saw after the gold ETF launch, it was actually a pretty big drop. It dropped from 456 down to 410, and it pretty much consolidated within that level for a while. So something to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I concur. I concur with that. So with the Bitcoin ETF, going back to what Isaac said, so a lot of what was priced in, well, a lot of uh, the ETF, pretty much the ETF approval was priced in probably, what, a week and a half before it got approved. It was fully priced in. And so we expected some type of decline. I do think I agree with you that in the long run, the price will do well simply because with the ETF, you're going to have a multiplier effect because at the end of the day, it's attracting new money that was not here previously in terms of, I mean, a sovereign wealth fund would not go to any type of exchange and buy a Bitcoin, but they will 100% buy an ETF um, after it's matured sometime, right? After the ETF has matured, uh, we'll start to see way more inflows, like maybe 2025, 2026, you're gonna see like a crazy uh, number for that year of inflows because of the maturity now has been around for two years or whatever, and it somewhat has a floor uh, in that ETF, and that would allow larger institutions and funds to get in the game. So I agree that long-term ETF is only a good thing. I just think it was simply priced in. And then, as you just pointed out, Vince, that makes sense that uh, a lot of what has been inflows has just been recycled cash from the Grayscale ETF because their fees are just astronomically high compared to it. I mean, if you really look at it, it's eight times higher, 10 times higher than a lot of those fees. And so, I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. I actually wasn't aware of that either. Yeah, I guess- It's you're... like in my mind, when people were getting out of Grayscale, they were getting out. I didn't think about them recycling just into another ETF. Yeah, if Grayscale was smart. They probably would have suspected that and like lowered their fees so they could like kept a larger amount. But I'm sure they probably did the math and were like, oh, we'll probably lose 5%. We'll probably still make more money without them versus like lowering their annual fees. So I'm sure they thought about it. But if this keeps happening, man. They might have to might have to change some things around. Anything happening with the Fed or uh, real estate that you think could like affect markets here in the short term? Stuff is always happening with the Fed. And I guess so let's look at it from like a theme, right? So like the biggest thing with the Fed has been obviously rate cuts. We've been talking about it too. I feel like I got to clear something up still. I feel like when I hear people talk about inflation, they still talk about it as if transitory could actually be a thing in terms of inflation. Meaning they talk about it as if inflation is actually like prices are coming down. And I feel like people are still genuinely confused in that disinflation, it, only refers to the rate at which inflation increases. That uh, is what's been slower. And so when you hear the Federal Reserve say transitory, as they were years ago, what he meant was the rate of change won't be as sticky at six to 9%. That's what he meant. He didn't mean that price, uh, the inflation print will come in at a negative three at some point in time. I've never seen a negative inflation print in my life, and I don't know if I ever will. So. I just wanted to, to clear that up. So when we talk about inflation coming down, we mean disinflation. Prices will always go up. As long as that number is above zero, that means prices are going up no matter what. Just remember that. So if it's three, that means it go, it's going up at 3% a year. If it's two, 2% 2 a year. So yeah, I feel the need to clarify that. Now, we talked about the reasons the Federal Reserve could potentially uh, cut rates on one of the pods ago. I'll make it two of them ago. And one of those here, I wrote out a kind of wrote it out to myself here. So here are the reasons as to why they could potentially cut rates. So low growth plus disinflation plus strong labor market, that equals rate cuts. Low growth, disinflation, weak labor market, that also equals uh equals rate cuts. Recession <laughs> equals rate cuts. Too restrictive equals rate cuts. And so those are the four scenarios in which we cut rates. And three of them could exist at one time, not four of them, but three of them could exist at one time. I think what the Fed, the reason why we've called it out so early is because we've seen disinflation to the point where 
it went from nine to three. And so now we're in an overly restrictive territory. And so if we still have rates at five and a quarter and the last inflation print, I'll use a uh, core CPI, basically 4%, it was 3.9, so basically 4%. So we're still at 1.25% in terms of the restrictive level, that's core. And so the Federal Reserve wants to get that to, you know, one, maybe below 1%. And so I think that's why they went ahead and forecasted three rate cuts because they wanted to not remain restrictive because if you remain restrictive too long, that could force you into a recession. And obviously we know why a recession would bring on rate cuts to spur growth and pull us out of a recession. And then I'll go to, I'll uh, talk about this low growth plus disinflation plus strong labor market, which is actually, is pretty crazy. But if we're projecting a GDP of, you know, 1.4%, we're, inspe we're expecting inflation to stay around two and a half, three percent. True inflation, by the way, it's like 1.86. Um, but if we're expecting inflation to stay around that number and then we continue to have a strong labor market, I don't see why the Fed would cut in that in that situation. But based on what the talk has been, they would still cut to spur on more growth just because we're in a low growth territory. So they'll bring that low growth up to growth if that makes sense. The other scenario, low growth, disinflation, weak labor market. Obviously, they will cut rates to spur on growth the inside of the labor market and as well add to GDP. And all these scenarios with these rate cuts, I see inflation coming back, by the way. Basically, guys, it doesn't make sense for the Fed to cut rates. Like, if you look at it right now, uh, and if you look at what they forecasted, but if you look at the data right now, it literally doesn't make sense. We just have like the lowest print in a long time on unemployment, on the unemployment numbers. We're adding more jobs, although we're getting revisions, so we'll see. But, you know, we've added jobs every month. Inflation has come down like the Federal Reserve wanted, and it's been sticking down there these last couple of prints. And we're still growing in positive territory, albeit at, you know, 1.4%, but hey, it's more than zero. And so really, there is no reason to cut rates. I gotta be real. And so it goes back to the question of two weeks ago, are they seeing something we're not in terms of something breaking here in, in the next few months? Or did they want to kind of put that expectation in the market to kind of help spur it on a bit um, because of the election? Yeah, they say they won't, don't want to get put, huh? I was going to say, maybe they're trying to get the markets hot because of the election, but the market's already hot. <laughs> yeah. And then even on the, just if you want to go over to the fiscal side, like last year, fiscal and or the last couple of years, I should say, fiscal policy has like outshined monetary policy. But going into 2024, we're not going to have nearly as much uh, fiscal stimulus. And so now monetary policy will really, really, really start to catch up. And maybe that's also part of the reason they were like, hey, we're going to have to go ahead and be prepared to cut rates because all these lagging effects are now finally starting to take on. Ooh. Yeah, I guess we'll just see what happens. I mean, I generally concur with uh, JT's synopsis there. I think it makes sense that the Fed would not cut rates because I likewise don't really see any reason for them to need to. Again, and I think we touched on this last time we had one of these calls, the interest, like, like the rates right now are not historically crazy high. They never got to the point where they were significantly higher than the average historic rate uh, that we've had in this country for you know our, our all of our history, we were just moving from zero to something higher. So I don't really see the impetus for cutting rates when we're like kind of at an average. We're at like a historic average. We could maintain this for a long time. This isn't we're not in high rate territory, historically speaking. So yeah, and if the economy's chugging along, if equities are fine, you know, if we're still growing economically, there's not really a reason you need to cut rates, especially when inflation is not quite at where we want it to be. Um, I see rates maintaining their current course for the foreseeable future until inflation is fully addressed. And even then, I mean, like, I don't know, like I, I generally, I generally like see a, a, us needing a reason to start cutting rates. So I wouldn't make any strong rate cut predictions for the foreseeable future. I think last time we talked a bit about how there would be an impetus for the Fed to cut rates without something breaking is was like our general synopsis. And I could see that occurring, but uh, I definitely 
I don't know. I'm not like I'm not like betting on it. Why do you think the market is projecting six rate cuts? Although the consensus is that we've achieved a soft landing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Six market- rate cuts in, in this year? I thought it was three. So that's what the Fed is projecting. The market, they're projecting six pretty much at every meeting. And so if you do the math, so three rate cuts, we all assume 25 basis points, obviously at 75, uh, you double that. So you're looking at one and a half percent. So they're projecting cutting off one and a half percent on the Fed funds rate, although the consensus is a soft landing. Like, how is that not the most confusing market in history? I mean, they might be, and this is just my thoughts. I remember we were looking at the synopsis on like uh, like the likelihood of a recession in 2024. Mm-hmm. And it was in December of 2023 that the New York Fed put recession chance at 51.8%. A few other places put recession kind of at like a coin toss for 2024. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that there's a likely recession, but if there are still a lot of, you know, reputable places predicting, you know, recession to be kind of like a, tw- a coin toss, you could see some people in the market factoring that in and being like, well, we could see a rate cut, you know, happening after a recession is called, you know, some sort of like spook recession happening during this year. Huh. I guess I guess we shall see. It's so many reasons uh, that the Fed could cut rates. Because I even thought about uh, the deficit. It's like, bro, they're completely aware that the longer we remain at 5% or go higher, it just makes servicing our nation's debt that much more expensive. And so I know they have to be thinking about, okay, how do we basically lower this debt burden for the country without seeming political? Let's throw in three random fucking rate cuts and leave the market up to the speculate as to why we're going to cut rates. I'm sure it's not that black and white, but, you know, that's one of the reasons I thought about uh, because it just doesn't they weren't their for guidance on cutting rates were absolutely horrible. It's like it's good that they forecasted cutting rates, but it's like there's so much speculation within that one aspect of the last meeting. It's insane. So, yeah, yeah, we shall see. We shall see. I do still think we're going to get a recession, either Fed induced or it was already baked in and it's happening. <laughs> Yeah, one way or another, I do still think we're going to get one. I don't think we're going to get out of it unscathed. Yep. Um, yep. Side note, Citadel is now the most profitable hedge fund. Well, I guess once again, second behind them, I believe was Bridgewater. Or Bridgewater was third. I'm not sure. But I thought that was pretty impressive after like all they went through GameStop and pretty much everything. Payment for order flow. I mean, all that stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, good by him. Good by King Griffin. A lot of people think that Citadel had a play in uh, Terra Luna. Oh, they just filed for bankruptcy today, Chapter 11. Who did? Uh, Terraform Labs. Mm-hmm. I can wow. hear Terra Luna. They, they, they were still profitable. No, I'm just playing. Uh, I was about to say, you got to be kidding me. Say no. <laughs> but NVIDIA hit an all-time high today. And I, I was looking at um, NVIDIA's PE. Bro, it was 80. I don't know if you guys know, like you're saying that a, a, a um, PE multiple of eighty. Yes, Nvidia. Wow. So correction income in. Maybe right. That's what we. That's what you would expect, right? But then you look into it. So you know they supply chips to AWS, and I looked up their market share earlier. I was like, man, what is their market share of like cloud infrastructure? It's thirty-one percent or thirty-three percent, something like that. Thirty-seven percent. I'm like, god damn. And then. I guess I don't really know what's going on uh, in China in terms of the chips, so I can't speak on that. But demand for chips, I mean, man, it seems to be just genuinely strong on an institutional side. And even if they can't afford it, you know, NVIDIA has like a whole scheme where they help finance their customers' purchases from them. Mm. They basically pay for it for them. It's like a whole scheme. Like they use like a thing. It's legal. But uh He's like another company, and yeah, they basically pay for everything. So even if you can't afford it as a company, oh, you can afford it with NVIDIA. And so it's like they found a way to just kind of plant themselves, bro. And yeah, even at a 4P of 80, I don't know. Because even, you know, six months ago, however long that was, I'm looking at it pop. And I'm thinking, oh, definitely what you just said, a correction from here. And we pulled back, what, 20% maybe? And now we're back at an all-time high. It's pretty crazy. Up 25% year to date. And to give guys perspective, Apple's PE 
is 30. So, or about 30. So there are, uh, if you want to talk about something being overvalued, but kind of defying physics, it would be NVIDIA. Damn. Yeah, with the whole AI narrative, I'm kind of not surprised, but we'll yeah. see, man. We'll see. All right, boys. So thank you all for coming to Bitcoin Nation. We'll see everybody on the flip side. Hey, always appreciate you guys. If you got value, like, comment, subscribe, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your cousin, tell your grandma, tell your granddaddy, tell your friends. And we'll see you on the next one. So you're just not going to tell them to tell their colleagues too. fuck the colleagues. Hey, crazy, hey don't forget your colleagues. Don't forget your colleagues, your pupils, your cohorts. Tell everyone. I think it's their cohorts. It's cohorts. Co cohorts. <laughs>